All right. I love this chapter, Romans 10. It's so clear, the way, the way that the um, people get saved. You know, it, it just really outlines the, you know, everything that has to happen and, and, and puts it, in, in my mind, you know, my mind thinks very logically, step by step by step, and this just outlines everything here. Like it says in verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So obviously it says the first statement is that, hey, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord is saved. And then it goes and explains that in detail saying, well, basically it's impossible to call on God without believing first. Right? So he's saying, how shall they call on him whom they not believe? But then it goes on and says, and how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? Obviously in order to believe something, you have to know about it. You have to have heard about it. So he's saying, well, people aren't going to believe unless they've heard about it. And then, how shall they hear without a preacher? Someone needs to be doing it. Someone needs to be doing the preaching and the talking in order for people to hear about it, in order to hear and believe, in order to believe and call upon the name of the Lord. And how shall they preach except they be sent, as, as it is written, out before the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And then verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We get so much doctrine on our soul winning out of this one passage just because it breaks it down so simple and it deals with this subject so very clearly. And what I'm preaching about this morning is one aspect of our soul winning. It's actually the last thing that we do and it's known as or referred to as the sinner's prayer. Okay, we practice the sinner's prayer here in this church when we go out soul winning. By the way, in case you didn't know that, this is an essential step of, of giving the gospel to somebody and getting them saved is also following up with the sinner's prayer. I am a believer in the sinner's prayer. There are those that will criticize you for doing the sinner's prayer. Oh, you, know, you hear it all the time. Oh, what, you think you just pray a prayer and you're saved? Well, the Bible says right here, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But it's not just, you know, basically it's impossible to call upon God unless you believe. The faith has to be there. We know that, you know, Lord, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yes, faith is essential. It's what's needed for salvation. But you can't, and you can't call on God without having that faith without believing. The, the calling on God is the result of your belief. Now, I have tons of Scripture this morning that we're going to look at because I want to prove to you how scriptural this actually is of somebody bowing their head and calling on God for their salvation. I don't ever want, and, and, and it hasn't gotten to this point, we're not at this point yet, and, and I don't want it to get this way, but it, it has a tendency to happen where we focus so much on believe because that is where the focus should be spent. Amen. But we have a tendency to get imbalanced. And then you hear criticisms from other people. And when it's not preached on, I don't hit on the topic, then it, it's easier to get your mind kind of screwed up on this. Now, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to show you just, just examples in the New Testament about calling upon the Lord, calling upon the name of Jesus Christ, calling upon God in order to be saved for our salvation. First Corinthians 1, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're sanctified, you're saved, right? You're sanctified in Christ Jesus. You're set apart in Christ because you believe. Called to be saints with all them that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. He's speaking to the church and everybody in every place that call upon the name of Jesus Christ. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we, might, whereby we must be saved, right? The name of Jesus Christ. That's who we need to call upon in order to be saved. Look at Acts chapter 2. Actually, yeah, go ahead. Go to Acts chapter 2. Actually, no, go to Acts 22. I'm sorry, I'll just read this for you. Real famous por portion of Acts chapter 2, verse 21. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Basically the same thing that we saw in Romans chapter 10. Acts chapter 22. Acts 
Acts chapter 22, we see what happened to the Apostle Paul after he saw the vision of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, right? When the Apostle Paul was, was traveling to Damascus, he was persecuting the church. Many people say that the Apostle Paul actually like, got saved because Jesus Christ appeared to him. I don't think the Apostle Paul got saved until he spoke with Ananias. Now, Jesus appeared to him. He said, you know, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? And he was blinded. Right? And, and you, could, you look at the symbolism of just being blinded anyways. I mean, he was blind. Now, that's not the, the direct proof, and we're going to see the actual direct proof. It's more of an indirect supporting evidence that he was blind and didn't receive his sight again until he spoke with Ananias. But look at verse number 14. Or verse 13. Let's start in verse 13. Um, Ah, uh, verse 12, because that's kind of the middle of a sentence. Verse 12. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Verse 16, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So at this point, we see Ananias is still treating Paul as if he's unsaved. Because I don't think he was saved up to this point. That's why he's saying, well, look, God appeared unto you. He wants you to be this chosen vessel. He's got all this work for you to do. So why are you waiting? Call on the name of the Lord and get baptized. Now we know, and again, I'm not going to go into this doctrine, that it's not the baptism that literally washes away your sins, right? That's just a figure. The, the calling on God and getting saved is where the, 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 the um, remission of sins is found. So he says here, he tells them to wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He tells them you need to call on God. You need to call on the name of the Lord for his salvation. And he does that, and he gets saved. And, and we see that example here in the New Testament of even the Apostle Paul calling on the name of the Lord at the time of his salvation, which was after Jesus appeared to him in the way. And the reason why I don't think he got saved in the way is because that would be the only example that we have ever of Jesus Christ of, uh, apart from when he was on this earth, you know, give, preaching the gospel after his resurrection of just showing up to someone and getting somebody else saved. Because God has given, has committed unto us the word of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation, that we're supposed to be reconciling people unto God, that Christ works in us, but that we are required it to go out and preach the gospel in order for people to get saved at all. I don't believe Jesus Christ is just personally appearing to people and just giving them the gospel and giving them an opportunity to get saved without us. And Obviously, we have a, a, an instance here with the Apostle Paul where the whole thing was, was out of the ordinary. However, I still don't think that that changes. You know, his salvation, I believe, happened when he spoke with Ananias. And that's what we see here. Hey, you know, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But I wanted to focus on that phrase there. He's you know, calling on the name of the Lord. This is what he was telling him to do. When Ananias is preaching the gospel to Saul... And telling him to get saved, what did he have him do? He said, call on the name of the Lord to get saved. This is what we do when we preach people the gospel. You get them to understand. Because here's the thing. Getting saved is a decision that you have to make. You can have the head knowledge and understanding of, of the events that transpired with Jesus Christ. You can understand that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, that he was born of a virgin, that he did a bunch of miracles, that he died on the cross, that three days later he rose again from the dead and still not be saved. You could know all of that. You could understand all of that and still not be saved. You need to put your faith and your trust. It has to be your belief. You have to basically own that belief as being your own before you can be saved. That's right. You have to say, this is actually what I believe, and I'm staking my faith, my soul, my faith on Jesus Christ. That is the moment of salvation. Right. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 
I just want to show you how scriptural and biblical this concept is of calling on the name of the Lord. Because again, like I said before, people will criticize it to the point where I've even heard people say, you're adding works to salvation. Well, as soon as you say, you got to call on Jesus Christ, you got to call, you, know, you have to say some prayer to be saved, then all of a sudden you're adding works unto salvation. Now, in Romans 10, when we started off, was that adding works when he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Of course not. Look at, uh, you're in 2 Corinthians 6, look at verse number 2. For he saith, I have heard thee, and think about that word, heard, heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So in that day of salvation, he says, I have heard thee. Well, how can he hear you unless you're calling on him, unless you're talking to him unless you're speaking to him in some way it's the only way you could hear in order for God to hear you you need to be calling on him some people claim we're adding works of salvation that I, that I just mentioned you know Bible says in Ephesians 2 8 9 it's a verse we quote very often when we're out soul winning for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works as any man should boast obviously salvation is not works based whatsoever it's based on our faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we get saved. But think, of, think about this now real briefly, because we like to use illustrations. We used to use, I use a lot of examples to try to get people to understand a concept. Right? Salvation is a real simple concept to grasp. It's as easy as receiving a gift. Right? The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So even in Scripture, we find this illustration being used of a gift. It, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's eternal life is a gift. It's something that's given to you. And we go in depth explaining what a gift really is just to get people to understand the simplicity behind salvation and eternal life itself. Explain that, you know, in order to receive a gift, it has to be free. Otherwise, it's not a gift. If I have to pay you any money in order to receive something, you can't call that a gift. By definition, it's no longer a gift. I'm purchasing it. If I'm doing work for it, if you say, you know, we use the Bible, I use this, Bible all, the, this example all the time. You know, if I want to give you this Bible for a gift, but I ask you to give me a dollar, is that a gift? No. It's a great deal because this Bible is worth a lot more than a dollar, but it's not a gift. Or if I say, I don't want any money, I'll give you this Bible free of charge. But first you have to go wash my car. Is that a gift? Of course not, because you're working for it. And we, we all know this illustration, this example. We use this all the time. But what if I were to say to you, I want to give you this. This is a gift, and I'm going to give it to you for free. If nothing else, you just have to ask me for it. Do you want the gift? If you want the gift, if you want the gift, just ask me for it and I'll give it to you. Are you going to say, and let's say, let the real example, let's say, here, I want you to have this. All you have to do is ask me for it. If you want this Bible, ask me for it. If she asks me for it, is that working? Are you going to say, oh man, she just worked for it. She just earned that gift by asking you for it. See how ridiculous it is to call that a work? It's not a work at all. Right. What you're doing is professing what's in your heart. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what it is. When you call on the name of the Lord, you are confessing with your mouth what you believe in your heart. Why? Because you want to let God know that you believe on Christ. And the way that you communicate with anybody, including God, is by speaking it, by saying it, right? right? By, by demonstrating, well, in your heart, you, you, you know, if you want someone to know something about you, you tell them. Okay. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. This is all throughout Scripture. We started with Romans 10 because I think that's just the most clear place. It gives you the whole breakdown of people need to be sent. People need to be preaching the gospel in order for other people to hear the gospel, in order for them to believe on Jesus, in order for them to call upon the name of the Lord. It's a very simple process, and it breaks it down, but this is 
all throughout Scripture. We're going to find the same concept being taught. Look at verse 35 of Matthew 12. Verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil, tre uh, out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Verse 36. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Look at verse 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. We're justified or condemned based on our words. Now, if you have the words of calling upon Jesus Christ, you're justified. And if you don't have those words, you're going to be condemned because there's plenty of other words that you've spoken that are going to get you into trouble. Right. Turn your foot to John chapter 4. I just want you to see this concept. It's not foreign. It's not found in one place. It's all throughout the Bible. And by the way, this is how we judge if someone's saved or not. It's by their words. By their word, it's not by their actions. It's by their words. What do they say to you? Right. What are they telling you they believe? Because now look, I know that people can lie. But I can't always know. Usually I can't know if someone is lying or not. But we know that salvation is not based on our works. We know that I don't have to do anything in order to be saved. We know that it's based on your faith, on what you believe about Jesus Christ, if you're putting your faith in Him or not. The only way I'm really going to know that is by asking somebody. Because let me ask you this, is it possible for somebody to put on a really big show and look really holy and, and look as if they really believe in Jesus Christ and not actually be saved? Is that possible? Of course it is. We see the example with Judas Iscariot, where... He spent a huge portion of his time with Jesus and with the disciples and going out and mimicking and doing the things so that nobody suspected him of being the traitor. He had everybody fooled. He looked really good. But he wasn't really saved. You can't just go off of what a person does to determine if they're saved because they all thought Judas was saved. Now, he probably lied, too. I'm sure he lied also. So you're not going to know. With someone like that, you're, not gonna, you know, you're probably not going to know anyway. But at the end of the day, when you, when you want to know what someone believes, you ask them. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, the Bible says. So you're going to get a good idea of what someone believes based on what they're saying. John chapter 4, look at verse number 7. We're going to see an example here of the woman at the well and what Jesus says to her now look, is, is the woman at the well a good example of, of, that we see of soul winning in the Bible? I think so. I mean, think about it. How many examples do we really have of one person leading another person to Christ? Not very many. We've got the doctrine laid out. We've got the understanding that we got the commandments laid out to preach the gospel every creature. We have all of this stuff, but not a whole lot of actual, you know, real life examples recorded in Scripture. This is one of them where Jesus Christ is speaking with the woman at the well. Look at verse number seven. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw near, to draw, excuse me, to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He's saying, If you knew the gift of God. If you knew that there's this gift available, and if you knew who's, who's talking to you right now, who's saying, give me to drink, he said, if you only knew, he says, you would have asked him. Basically, you'd be asking me right now. And look what he says, and he would have given thee living water. He's saying, and I'll give you the living water right now. He says, if you, just, if you knew who I was, you would ask me right now, basically for eternal life because that's the gift of God. 
right? You would ask me for it. If you knew who I was, you would ask me for it. When you get saved, you have to know who Jesus Christ is. You have to know what he did. But once you know that and you believe, you will ask him for it. And I believe that. You're going to ask him for it. Look, I know the way. I don't know how everyone else got saved. I know how I got saved. And I know the way that I got saved is not as neat and clean as the way that we try to, you know, we get people saved at the door. When we go out and give a great, thorough presentation of the gospel, and we try to do our best to tell them everything we possibly can about eternal life and salvation by grace and all this other stuff to just really make it clear, use these examples and get the whole concept home. That's not the way it was when I got saved. I don't know exactly where I picked it up along the way. I don't know who the preachers of righteousness were that had the influence in my life to help me to understand the concept of salvation. But I remember when I got saved, I was home alone in my apartment, in my bedroom, and I called upon Jesus Christ to save my soul. I didn't want to go to hell. At some point, I realized that it was just by faith, and I was broken, and I was ready to say, God, I need you to save me. Jesus Christ, please save me. And I don't remember the exact words that I said. And to be honest with you, I don't even think I said any words out loud. But you know what? I was speaking to God still because I was speaking to him in my heart. Right. And that's another point. We're going to get to that in just a minute. How calling on the name of the Lord doesn't have to be an audible thing. Because you can call on God speaking in your heart also. Amen. But look at what we see here. Because that's how I got saved. I called on Jesus Christ. Now, I believed. I, I had to have believed. If I didn't believe, I wouldn't have called on Jesus Christ. But it's something that happened. And to be honest with you, because I've asked people this question before, and I've had this discussion before about whether is it required, you know, do you need to call on Christ, do you need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved? I haven't talked to anybody ever that has ever told me that they never called on God for their salvation in one way or another of, of like acknowledging and, 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 in, and in some form asking God to save them. I don't know anybody that says, yep, I got saved, but I didn't do that. But let's keep reading here. So in, in verse 10, he says, look, if you would know who's given you, the, who, who, you know, that this gift is available and who I was, you would ask me and I would give it to you. He would give it to her as a result of her asking. Verse 11, The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank there of himself, and his children, and his cattle? Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now look at this, verse 15. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And she ends up asking him for that water. She said, that sounds good. I want that water. Now, you don't have to turn all these places. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, we're going to see an example, again, in the New Testament of salvation of someone calling on Jesus to get saved. A real-life example of something else that happened. Besides the Apostle Paul, we saw him calling on the name of the Lord and getting saved as Ananias was preaching unto him. Luke chapter 23, you're going to see the story of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. And of course, we know on, uh, when he was crucified, there were two thieves. There's two other malefactors that was crucified with him. Three people were crucified that day. Jesus Christ in the middle, on the left hand and on the right hand, there was, another, there was a thief on either side of him. In the other gospel accounts of this event, I'm going to read for you from Matthew 27, 44. The Bible says, The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. And in context, it's talking about they were reviling Jesus. They were mocking him. They were ridiculing him. The Pharisees were ridiculing him. Other people standing around were ridiculing him. And then the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in their teeth. Both of them. The thieves, plural. Mark 15, 32 Again, as they're mocking Jesus, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. Both of them were, were 
reviling Jesus, mocking him just like everybody else. But we're going to see another, another thing that happens with one of those thieves in Luke chapter 23. Look at verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Look at this. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. One of those thieves, after he had already reviled Jesus Christ, had a change in his heart. He realized who Jesus was. It's obvious because he said, don't you fear God? He says, this man has done nothing wrong. He realized who Jesus was. And then he called on him. He realizes it. He says, you know what? I'm in this condemnation. You're in this condemnation. But he didn't do anything wrong. And at some point, he believed whatever was required, that he's the Son of God, you know. And, and as soon as he called on him, Jesus said, you know what? Today you're going to be with me in paradise. Today is the day of salvation. And he called upon the name of the Lord. People have been saved by calling on the name of the Lord all throughout the Bible. We're going to look at some Old Testament references now. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. I'm going to read for you from Genesis 4 because... In the book of Genesis, of course, we start off with the creation story. We hear about Adam and Eve. And then you hear about um, Cain and Abel, right? The first two children. And, and then it starts to give genealogies and people who were alive during that time. And very early on, remember, Seth was a, 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 first, or a, a child of Adam and Eve, a direct child of Adam and Eve. And in Genesis 4, verse 26, it says, And to Seth... To him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. That's the point in history when men started calling on God. Now, Adam and Eve needed salvation. The moment they sinned, they needed salvation. And we see that the, symbolically they were covered with the animal skin. The blood was shed for the remission of their sins. And, you know, going on and on to the entire sermon just in that story alone. But, I mean, very early on in human history, men started calling, because men started to multiply, right? And it started here, right at the, at the, with, the grand, with one of the grandchildren of, of Adam and Eve. Not that that person was, but at that time, right? Just, just right away. And we know Adam and Eve lived to be really old. And um, you know, I don't think anyone other than um, Abel had even died yet any other person, human being. So that's when men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And, and all throughout the Old Testament, you're going to see people calling upon God. Paul, call upon the name of the Lord. And I do not have all those references because it would take way longer to go through all of those of people calling upon the Lord. But I want you to look at Psalm 116. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Now, I'll, I'll just bring this up right now as we're looking at this. Obviously, this in verse number two, him calling upon the Lord, is not referring to salvation. He's not talking about every day getting saved. So, if you're going to do your own Bible study into this subject and looking at calling on the name of the Lord, you do have to realize that and get everything in context because there are many times when people are calling on the Lord and it's not for their salvation. They're calling on Him because they want to be heard of Him. So just keep that in mind if you do study this out for yourself. You're going to find that also throughout the Bible. But the concept that I'm teaching this morning is definitely found in Scripture. We're going to see that as we get further into this psalm. Look at verse 3. The sorrows of death compass me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. 
Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Look at verse 10. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Verse 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Taking the cup of salvation is talking about salvation. He's like, I'm going to take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. The two are linked. Just, just one with the other. Jesus Christ likens being saved. Whosoever will, right, let him take of the cup of the water of life and drink, you know, eating a piece of bread, drinking a glass of water, walking through a door. That's how easy salvation is. And we see here, taking the cup of salvation and calling upon the name of the Lord. Yeah. It, is, it is just a natural step, a natural process of, uh, you know, in getting saved. Not that salvation is a big process, but it's just, it happens in an instant. It happens in a moment. You put your faith on Jesus Christ, and as a result, you are going to call on Jesus. You're going to call on the name of God. Why? Because I believed, like it says in verse 10, therefore have I spoken. As a result of that belief, you speak. As a result of that belief, you are calling on God. And, and I'm trying to imagine, just as a human being, as a person, when you realize you're a hell-bound sinner, and you realize there's this free gift, how do you not call on God? How do you not express in some way that you're putting your faith in God to God himself? I mean, to me, that's, that's one of those things. I mean, we, you, could, you could talk all day and, and build up these hypothetical situations. Right. But take a step back and say, like, is that ever really ever even going to happen? Because I don't see it happening. When you realize what the situation and you want to be saved, how do you not call on the God that you are putting all of your faith in, that you believe is real, that you believe you know, all this stuff about that, that you're not going to say anything to him, you're just going to keep it to yourself? You're just going to have that belief? I mean, I don't, I don't see that as being reality at all. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 53. Psalm 53. Psalm 53, verse number 1. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them has gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. Now, we just finished the Proverbs series, and we saw in the book of Proverbs, you know, we talking about the workers of iniquity, the evil, wicked people, usually talking about reprobates who eat up my people as they eat bread. It says they have not called upon God. And again, it's using that as, a, as an example of why they're not saved. Why are they not saved? Because they haven't called upon God. Why did they not call upon God? Because they didn't believe in Him. But they haven't called upon God. They're not saved. They called upon the name of the Lord in the Old Testament. Now we know that Jesus Christ is our Savior, and that's who we call upon for our salvation. Now, as I, as I was alluding to earlier, calling on Jesus does not have to be audible. Many people pray in their heart. And what's really interesting here in Psalm, turn if you would to 1 Samuel chapter 1, but in Psalm 53, that first verse, the fool hath said in his heart. So did the fool say there is no God? Yes, he did. But did he say it out loud? It says the fool said it in his heart. Right. So you can speak in your heart according to the Bible. Right. And we know this anyways, but I'm just pointing it out. I mean, there's scriptural evidence right there. It doesn't have to be something audible. Even the fool, the one that's saying in his heart there is no God, 
is speaking in his heart. Right. And he's not calling on God in his heart. 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to see an example here also of, of a woman who is praying to God, but she's not praying audibly. And I'm just bringing this up because people, you know, we're talking about salvation and we're talking about calling on the name of the Lord. We will get people to speak an audible prayer when we're with someone at the door. We ask them to, to just repeat a prayer and, you know, explain that we're praying this to God. It's not for me. It's not to me. You know, only say these words if you're actually believing it in your heart. You know, we do our best to try to get them to understand that, that what they're doing, that it's not just some zombie thing of just, oh, just repeat this. Oh, okay, yeah, whatever. You know, like jump through some hoop. But it's in a real prayer to God. And that you're calling on God right now. And I'm just going to help give you some words to do that. That's, that's literally all we're doing when we lead people in prayer. We're leading them. But they have to obviously believe in their heart as they're calling upon God. Otherwise, they're not really even calling on God if they don't believe. But here's an example of a woman in verse uh, number 12, 1 Samuel chapter 1. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now, Hannah, she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. So Eli comes up to this woman, and he thinks she's just drunk. Because she's, you know, probably, she's just going, you know, her mouth's moving. No words are coming out. And he's just like, what is this woman? And she was upset, too, right? So she's probably like crying and stuff. And she's like, great, there's this drunk woman here, you know, uh, whatever. And in verse 14, it says, And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. So what she was doing, she was praying in her heart. She was praying unto God. And that is perfectly legitimate and acceptable in the sight of God to call on him with your heart. It doesn't have to be some audible, out loud thing. Now, turn if you would to Acts chapter 10 because I want to cover this. This seems to be the one example. Because we've already gone over quite a few examples Quite a few examples of people calling on the name of the Lord at the, the point of salvation. Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius is the one example, and, it, and I could see, I could understand why it's a good example of, of where people will turn to to say that, well, you don't have to call on the name of the Lord to be saved because we're going to see in Acts chapter 10 here with Cornelius. And, and the people of his household getting saved and speaking in other tongues. And we're going to look at this and, and see what, um, what we can learn from here. Look at verse number 1 of Acts chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his heart, excuse me, with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Jump down to verse number 34. We're going to catch up with Peter then being brought into his house and preaching unto him. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation that he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Now to all the people, excuse me, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. 
And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So, brief overview, right? We've got this man, Cornelius. He seemed to be a pretty good guy, right? He seemed to care about God, you know, to give money to, to church and stuff. But he wasn't saved. But he was real uh, uh, devoted, right? He was, he was someone who had uh, a, sincere, a sincere belief in his heart. But we see here, Peter comes, he preaches to him. And while he's still in the middle of preaching, the Holy Ghost comes upon them and they start speaking with other tongues. So they receive this sign. That, that, that God has given, and they start speaking with other tongues, proving that they are now endued with the Holy Ghost, that they have the Holy Ghost upon them. And it's obvious that they got saved. But um, just from this reading alone, you could say, yeah, but what if they already were believers, right? I mean, you could look at that and say, and they just didn't receive the, the power to speak with other tongues. Well, it's cleared up in Acts chapter 11. Turn, turn if you would to Acts chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 13 because they definitely got saved at this point. Look at verse 13. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Look at verse 14. Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. So he gets a little bit more clear on what the instructions were on why he was calling for Peter to come to his house. And for, you know, from the angel he says... He's going to tell you words whereby you, may be, you shall be saved. He was there to preach the gospel to him. And we saw when we read in Acts chapter 10, that's exactly what he did. He, he preached unto him Jesus Christ, how he was died, how he rose again from the dead. He preached unto them the gospel. That's what he was saying unto them. Verse 15, And as I began to, began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So you're saying, well, why are you bringing this up? Well, I'm bringing this up because it is an important story. And we need to, to if we're going to understand a doctrine like calling on the name of the Lord, we ought to understand how it applies in all these situations. Now, again, getting a little academic for a minute. Is it possible for a person to be saved without saying some form of a sinner's prayer? Like, even if it's just as simple as the thief on the cross saying, you know, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. I don't know for a fact, but I do know this. I know that all a person has to do is to believe. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. And that's the bottom line. We know that much. But to me, it just I don't see how someone can believe and not have some way of expressing that God. And even in this story, and actually you say, well, yeah, but they were like, Peter's still preaching. It's not like they were calling upon God. He wasn't leading them in prayer when they got saved. Well, it doesn't record, first of all, what happened in their heart. For one. So that's an unknown. I can't say that that's exactly what they did. Right? I don't know. But what's also interesting is they obviously believed, in, but then how did Peter even know that they got saved? Because they spake. Because they opened up their mouth, their mouth and started to speak. So as a result of their belief, they spake. It, it, it follows the one with the other. And I would go as far as to say, I think it happens every single time. Every time you have that belief, it's going to follow with 
some profession, some confession on Christ, whether it's in your heart, whether it's out loud, whether it's in a prayer at the door with somebody. It has to be made. And I think, these, I think that these people probably did that in their heart, but who knows, maybe they were speaking it in other tongues, right? Like, like, like it's just, it's because it's so instantaneous when you get saved, their faith was put on Christ and as they're, you know, they, they might have even been calling out on God with other tongues. I don't know, because it doesn't tell us what they were saying either. But we can't overlook the fact that as a result of their belief, they did end up speaking. <clears throat> now, turn if you would to Luke chapter 6. I'm actually getting through this a little bit quicker than I thought I would. That's good. That's a good thing. We have a lot, we have a lot of scripture that we're looking at, so we're almost done. I'm literally on my last page of notes here. We pray with people at the door after we give them the gospel. And honestly, we don't count anybody as being saved unless they have said that prayer and uh, called on God for their salvation. That's the way that we do things here. Now, again, is it possible that maybe some of the people we've spoken to who didn't want to say a prayer with us actually got saved? I hope so. I mean, that's, that would be great. And the confession that's made, sometimes you wonder, like, well, they confessed that they believe on Jesus Christ, that they believe the gospel, but technically they weren't calling on God for their salvation. We don't count people like that. But if, I mean, if the belief is there in their heart, though, and it's genuine and they honestly believe, I'm going to say that that person's saved, but we don't count that because the thing is, if someone actually believes, you know, it, 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 what we do, and again, we could only judge based off of the words that people say. If they're not willing to, to tell God that their faith is in Christ alone, then we don't count them as being saved. Now, is it possible they were? If, they're, if we're having a conversation and they're saying, I believe that Christ paid for my sins, I believe that there's no way you could lose, I believe it's all based on faith, I believe, you know, I believe, I believe all this stuff, they're confessing it with their mouth already. They're saying it out loud. But at that point, to me, it's like, well, why in the world would you not tell God that? And one of the reasons why we don't count that as being saved until they actually call on the name of the Lord is, for one, we see all the scriptures on people calling on the name of the Lord because they don't have to convince me that they're saved. They have to tell God that that's what their belief is. You don't ask Him for salvation. But number two is it's a lot easier for people, and I've noticed this, it's a lot easier for people to lie to a, to a person at your door than it is to open up your mouth unto God. Even a lot of people who don't claim to believe in God don't have the nerve to go through with something where they're actually praying to God or saying something. You know, because there, there's something important about that. We, you know, and there are, look, there's some people that'll just do it anyways because they don't care because they just say it doesn't matter at all. But most people, if you don't believe something, you're not going to tell God that you do believe that. Right. Most people. Right. Most people won't, won't confess to something to God that they don't actually believe in their heart. And, you know, when we do the sinner's prayer, there's another reason for why we do it. I mean, this is the main reason, it's a scriptural reason, but it's also to make sure because of that fact that I just mentioned that people don't want to say something they don't believe in, is to also help us to make sure that we did a thorough enough job when we're going through someone. Like, uh, I've had multiple times different places where people have literally stopped praying to God because I said something, I was helping to lead them in a prayer where they didn't actually believe that, that part and they stopped. And then I realized I didn't do a very good job of explaining that part to them. And my prayer, what, what I usually, I lead people with like the same prayer every time. Just about. I mean, it, it's very, very similar. And I say things, I, this, is, this is a typical example of a prayer I, I lead people in at the door. They say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, right? I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for all of my sins. 
You know, please save me right now and give me a free gift of eternal life. I'm only trusting in you to get to heaven. Something like that. And, and what I've had, and I haven't had this happen in a long time now, I think just, just through experience and stuff and just getting a little bit better at, at, at doing a thorough job. But that help part. Right, because that seems to be a, a place where people tend to blow over when you're doing giving the gospel too. Yeah. And I've had people stop and say, "Well, wait a minute. I, I don't believe I deserve to go to hell." Right, and then to stop. But but see, the reason I bring that up is because they're not going to tell God that they believe that they should be going to hell when they don't believe that. Right. They don't want to say that because they're praying to God. And this is one of the reasons why we go through that prayer also because it gives us an opportunity to say, hey, I mean, if it's coming out of their mouth, if they're praying to God, if we've made that clear, look, you're praying to God right now and you, you know, this is you putting your faith in Christ or, or telling God that your faith is in Christ, that's what we have to go on. And that's what we're going to use as our indication. But see, that's also the way that I got saved. That's also the way everybody I've ever known has gotten saved is by calling on the name of the Lord. You're in Luke chapter 6, and I brought this, I alluded to this scripture earlier, but we're going to see it. Verse 43, for a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good, the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. It's what people say is how you know what's in their heart. We need to believe on Jesus with all of our heart. You only know whether or not someone does that based on what's coming out of their heart through their mouth. And what comes out of our mouth when we believe on Christ is calling on the name of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 4.13, you don't have to turn else read this for you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. And then we saw that already in Psalm 116, verse 10. I believed, therefore have I spoken, I was greatly afflicted. It's this natural result that happens. When you believe something, you speak about it. When, you, when it's in your heart, it comes out of your mouth. We definitely believe in using the sinner's prayer. My last point is that I just want to make this clear too for anyone who might be listening. I think everyone in this church probably is already well aware of this, um, especially if you've gone out and done any soul winning with us. We do not practice or believe in this one, two, three, repeat after me thing. Okay? It happens too much. And that's why soul winning gets a bad rap anyways. That's why people criticize and mock soul winning. Oh, you go door to door. You Baptist, you go door to door. And you just think that some little prayer saves somebody. Nope. No, that's not what we believe. We do a very thorough presentation of giving to God. We, we, we go to lots of scripture. We don't even just do the Romans road here. Not, not anything wrong with the Romans road. But this, we treat uh, preaching the gospel very seriously here at Word of Truth Baptist Church. We're going to go and spend the time necessary we're not just interested in, you know, here's five minutes and then go, I just got to keep going to the next door, next door, next door. It's not about how many doors we knock. It's about spending the time necessary. If it's 10 minutes, if it's 20 minutes, if it's 45 minutes, if it's an hour, if it's two hours, if we have to come back and talk to them again, then that's what we're going to do to get them to understand salvation. Whatever the hang-up is, let me show you the scripture. Let me show you what the Bible says. Understand this. Hey, understand that salvation is eternal. It's eternal life. You can never lose it. Understand all this stuff to get people to understand the gospel. So that when they hear, then they can believe because they've understood it. And we're going to do our best to get that part, get, get the gospel understood. And at the end of everything... When they've already confessed that they are believing on this, they already understand it, we're already asking them questions, then we're going to say, okay, well, if you believe all of this stuff that we just spent an hour going over, then let's just, you know, I'll help you word a prayer where you can call upon the name of the Lord. You can call on Jesus to save you. Would you like to do that? If they believe it, I mean... The vast majority of the time, I, you know, I don't know what the outlier might be. They're going to say, yes. Why? Because I believe, therefore have I spoken. 
I hope this clears up for you because too often we want to, I mean, one, we want to think that, that more people are getting saved. Because I do too. I want to like, think that everybody's getting saved. I do. I want, I, I want people to get saved. That's why we go out and do what we do. I want people to get saved. But we need to be very careful and make sure that we are, do, you know, and that we're not getting slack on this either of, of people calling on God. Because what that does, I mean, that cements their belief. When you're, when you're willing to say it out loud and you know, call on God, you're, you're, it's like, boom, you're doing it. I mean, what, I don't know at what point I believed on Jesus, but I know at the point I called on God, and I know I wasn't saved before that. Right. So it's, it's kind of like an instant, I think it's kind of like an instantaneous type of a thing where you're, you're yes, I believe, and I'm calling on God. But that's what we do here. That's what we believe, and this doctrine is not going to change. This is a fundamental doctrine, and you find the scriptural evidence for this all rampant throughout the Bible, people calling on the Lord for their salvation. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching that we've received from your word. God, I pray that you would please help us all as soul winners be very thorough in, our, in, in, in teaching people the gospel and showing them what Jesus Christ did for us. Lord, I pray that you would please help us never to fall into this trap of just thinking so much on the prayer that, that we're just trying to get people to repeat some words and just checking them off as being saved as opposed to being diligent to spend the time and get them to understand to then call upon you for, for their salvation, dear Lord. But we also want to make sure we don't get, get negligent of actually leading people to call on your name because it's definitely scriptural, it's definitely biblical, dear Lord. And we see the examples over and over and over again throughout, throughout the Bible of people calling upon you and, and with their mouth, confession is made unto salvation, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to, to be very um, thorough and complete in our soul-winning presentation, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.